Hello and welcome to Gospel Foundations, where today we will be taking a look at the temple now built. My name is Leslie Carroll, and it's my privilege to facilitate our study as God leads our look into the storyline of Scripture through the reality of who He is. If you'd like to know any more information about this study or any of our studies, you can find information on LifeWay.com. After God granted His request for wisdom, Solomon's wisdom became known far and wide. He was renowned for his ability to judge and rule his people. God was generous with his wisdom toward Solomon, and as God's children, we are promised that he will similarly be generous with us when we humbly ask for wisdom, believing in faith. And I had to stop and think, do we ask for God's wisdom? Oh, let's make sure that we do. One of the lasting contributions that Solomon would make to God's people and the story of redemption would be the construction of God's temple. Solomon was careful to obey instructions for building the temple in a way that magnified the greatness of God. And yet, this physical structure was only a shadow of God's true dwelling place that was yet to come, Jesus Christ. Let me ask, how does the temple point us to Jesus? Well, the temple was a place for the presence of God to dwell, which is now accomplished for us in Jesus and through His Holy Spirit. The temple was where sacrifices were for sin were made, and Jesus is the sacrifice that opens the door for our relationship with God the Father. And the temple was a place of holy reverence for the name of God. Jesus obeyed the Father completely for the glory of His name in the world. Well, let's set the context for our study. Solomon's fame soon spread throughout the entire earth. He was regarded as the wisest man in the world, and emissaries from all over came to Israel to seek his counsel. Solomon's kingdom grew uh, with his prestige, and as God had promised, Solomon grew in wealth and prosperity. His kingdom was one of excess and prosperity, and what pro this prosperity extended to everyone in his kingdom. And what's more, Solomon was a prolific student and writer. He studied zoology, biology, and botany, as well as recording thousands of proverbs and songs. Solomon had in mind one particular task with which to utilize his wisdom. Years earlier, Solomon's father, King David, had endeavored to build a house for God, a temple as a tribute to God's great name and renown. But God told David that this task was not meant for him, but rather his son Solomon would be the one to build the temple. Solomon found himself in a position with near unlimited resources at his disposal, and so it came time for him to fulfill what God had told David his son would do. The king set about building the temple for God. The temple's structure served God's will for his glory and his mission. Is it important for Christians to know about and to understand the building of the temple in the Old Testament? Well, the answer to that is yes. So the question then is why? Well, it's helpful to remember that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So God's expectations in the temple still have some application for us today. The temple actually foreshadows the coming of Jesus. The temple helps Christians understand the purpose of the church, the community of believers in Christ Jesus. Let's take a closer look at the temple, Jesus, and the church, how they each bear God's name, host God's presence, and are for God's mission. First, the temple bears God's name. Solomon built the temple for Yahweh. The temple hosts God's presence. The glory of the Lord filled the temple. And the temple is for God's mission, a place for all peoples to seek the Lord who alone is God. Next, Jesus bears God's name. 
John tells us that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus hosts God's presence. He came in glory as the one and only Son from the Father. Jesus is for God's mission. Jesus spoke of the sanctuary of his body in his sacrificial death and resurrection. And the church bears God's name. The church belongs to Jesus, the Christ, the Son of the living God. The church hosts God's presence. We are a sanctuary of the living God. The church is for God's mission. As the Father sent the Son, so we are sent on His mission, having received the Holy Spirit. Oh, the temple was to be a place where the name of God would be upheld and the presence of God would be experienced so that nations would know that the Lord is God. But in the temple, the path to the relationship with God was barred by walls and doors. Only priests could enter into His holy presence and then only by way of sacrifice. The temple screamed out the holiness of God and his expectations from his people. Jesus spoke of himself as God's temple, and in his life, death, and resurrection, he upheld God's name, he embodied God's presence, and he extended God's mission. Access to God the Father now comes to us freely by faith in Jesus Christ, the true temple of God. Now let's take a look into scripture at the temple bearing God's name. 1 Kings chapter 5 verses 1 through 5 and they read as follows. When Hiram king of Tyre heard that Solomon had been anointed king to succeed his father David, he sent his envoys to Solomon because he had always been on friendly terms with David. Solomon sent back this message to Hiram. You know that because of the wars waged against my father David from all sides, he could not build a temple for the name of the Lord his God until the Lord put his enemies under his feet. But now the Lord my God has given me rest on every side, and there is no adversary or disaster. I intend, therefore, to build a temple for the name of the Lord my God, as the Lord told my father David when he said, Your son, whom I will put on the throne in your place, will build the temple for my name. Names are so powerful. Mentioned Prince William or Harry, Bill Gates, Elon Musk, Tiger Woods, or any president, and you'll likely start an interesting conversation in the break room of your office or wherever. King Solomon knew the power of names, too. He knew the esteem and the honor that certain names deserve. This was one of the main reasons that he wanted to build a house for the Lord. How would the building of the temple magnify the name of God? Well, the temple was a magnificent structure designed and built by the wisest person in the world who had received his wisdom for the work from God. It showed that the blessings experienced by the nation of Israel were attributed by the people to the one true God. It would demonstrate the glory and the holiness of God for all the world to see. Up to this point in redemptive history, Israel's God was not associated with any particular place. He had manifested himself in visions, in a burning bush, in a pillar of fire, on the mountaintop, in the tabernacle, and with the Ark of the Covenant. But until now, there was no established place where his people could point and say, This is the house of our God. The moment was right because God gave Solomon rest on every side. God did this, not Solomon. God worked and moved to expand the kingdom of Solomon. And at this point, unlike in David's time, there was rest and peace all around. God had subdued the enemies of Israel and established them on every side. The temple was a tangible reminder of what the Lord had done for the nation that he loved. He was the one who brought Israel out of Egypt. He was the one who gave them his law. He was the one who brought them through the wilderness into a land flowing with milk and honey. 
He was the sovereign God who saved and established his people. Solomon responded to this sovereign work by erecting a building worthy of the God of heaven. Another reason, the chief one, that Solomon built the temple was because God promised King David that he would. Before Solomon was ever born, God declared to David that he would put his son on the throne and establish his kingdom. This promise was now coming to fruition in Solomon's day. Solomon knew that his father David was unable to build the temple because of the warfare that surrounded his life. Instead, because Solomon's reign was marked by peace and prosperity, he would engage in this work. The temple was meant to be a structure that paid honor to God. It was intended to be a place where people from all over the world would come to meet with and worship the one true God. The temple was not only evidence of God's work, it was evidence of God's keeping His word. We serve a God who keeps His promises. God does not play games with His people. He does not string us along to leave us in the dark. Rather, He is the promise-keeping God who never, ever fails. In the New Testament, Jesus spoke of Himself as the temple, the embodiment of God. Jesus not only bears God's name, He is God. He accomplished all the work that the Father had given Him to do, and all the promises of God find their yes in Him. He came to radically redefine how Israel understood the temple and its place among God's people. All that God intended to show with the temple He would show even so much more with his own son, who claimed that he was the true temple. For this reason, the name of God is no longer localized to a place. It is found in a person. We go to Jesus and we see the work and the promise of God on full display. Now, let's take a further look into scripture at the temple hosting God's presence. 1 Kings 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 10 through 14, and they read as follows. When the priest withdrew from the holy place, the cloud filled the temple of the Lord, and the priests could not perform their service because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled his temple. Then Solomon said, The Lord has said that he would dwell in a dark cloud. I have indeed built a magnificent temple for you, a place for you to dwell forever. While the whole assembly of Israel was standing there, the king turned around and blessed them. After Solomon completed the temple, he gathered all of Israel along with the priests, the Levites, and the leaders to bring the Ark of the Covenant to the Lord's house. And on that day, God displayed his glory among his people. Oh my, just imagine standing among the assembly, witnessing the spectacular display of God's glory. What are some ways that we should respond to the glory of the Lord? Well, for one thing, we should respond with humility and awe for God's glory and more with praise and adoration for God, and with blessing communicated to others for what the Lord has done. This event further established and confirmed Solomon's kingdom and reign, and it showed yet again God's love and his commitment to his people, the nation of Israel. Normally God dwelled in thick darkness in a place where no one could see him, but now God had come down to be with his people in a place built for his name and his presence. God was so near and real that day that even the priests had to stop what they were doing. It would be a mistake to think that the temple could fully house the presence of God. After all, the universe itself cannot contain all of God's glory because he is infinite and omnipresent. How could he possibly live in a temple that was so small by comparison. The temple was only a shadow of what was to come. God was not going to dwell ultimately within a temple built by the hands of humans. He was going to dwell on earth as a human being, as a descendant of David himself. 
On that day, Israel received the blessing of God himself. This is the greatest blessing that God can give to his people, himself. In the New Testament, I'm sorry, in fact, we will see throughout the Bible that God's intention has always been to dwell among his people. We see this theme from the beginning to the end of Scripture, from the beginning of the Old Testament to the end of the New Testament. Let's take a look. In Genesis, the first book of the Bible, chapters 1 through 3, we see that God walked with Adam and Eve in the garden before their sin resulted in banishment from his presence. In Exodus, chapter 29, verse 42, we see God gave Moses intricate details for the tabernacle and the ark to establish his presence among Israel and meet with them regularly. In Ezekiel chapter 10, verse 18, when Israel failed in their faithfulness to God's covenant, the most severe judgment from the Lord was removing himself from the temple. In the New Testament, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, God's promise to revisit his people and establish them once again was fulfilled in Jesus, who is called Emmanuel, which is translated, God is with us. And then, in the last book of the Bible, at the end of history, when all things are set right, we read this promise from Revelation chapter 21, verse 3. God's dwelling is with humanity, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God will, himself will be with them and will be their God. Praise the Lord. The great hope of the Christian life is not getting things from God. It is getting God himself. We have a God who wants to be known and who wants us to experience and enjoy his presence. The New Testament teaches that Jesus is the true temple of God and that he, as his followers, we also are the temple of God. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever meditated on that? That we are the temple of God. Because you see, God dwells in his people through the Holy Spirit. Consider what Peter said about this in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 5. Peter says, As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by people, but chosen and honored by God, you yourselves, as living stones, are being built to a, be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Many of us gather for worship and are never truly, we never truly recognize the greatness of the God that we are worshiping. Our hearts are filled with distractions, other duties to get to, and anxiety about the week ahead. But if what Peter said is true, and it is, then when we gather with God's people, we are engaging in the most climactic event of the entire week. Now, let's take a look into scripture at the temple advancing God's mission. 1 Kings chapter 8 verses 54 through 61, and they read as follows. When Solomon had finished all these prayers and supplications to the Lord, he rose from before the altar of the Lord where he had been kneeling with his hands spread out toward heaven. He stood and he blessed the whole assembly of Israel in a loud voice saying, Praise be to the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel just as he promised. Not one word has failed of all the good promises that he gave through his servant Moses. May the Lord our God be with us as he was with our ancestors. May he never leave us nor forsake us. May he turn our hearts to him to walk in obedience to him and keep his commands, decrees, and laws that he gave our ancestors. And may these words of mine, which I have prayed before the Lord, be near to the Lord our God day and night, that he may uphold the cause of his servant and the cause of his people Israel according to each day's need, so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the Lord is God and that there is no other. And may your hearts be fully committed to the Lord our God to live by his decrees and obey his commands as at this time. Let me ask, 
how does this blessing and the construction of the temple remind us of God's promise to bless all the nations of the earth? We see that the temple would be a place where all the peoples on the earth could seek out the presence of God, even though he is not constrained to a particular place. The people of God were to live in holiness and obedience because of God's presence in their midst, which would lead to justice in their nation and be a light to the entire world. This temple alone, of all the temples to all the gods in the world, was inhabited visibly and tangibly by the one true God with the display of his glory. We don't generally associate the nation of Israel with the term mission, especially when it comes to the temple, but a phrase that we tend to gloss over in this passage is perhaps the most important thing Solomon prayed here. He blessed the people, and he offered a prayer for the nation, that all the peoples of the earth know that the Lord is God. Verse 60. This was one reason God chose the nation of Israel. He didn't choose them for their own sake. He chose them for the sake of the nations. He is a global God who desires all the nations to be glad in him. Psalm 67. Israel was to be a particular people with a universal purpose to extend the name and the glory of God to the ends of the earth. Exodus chapter 19 verses 5 and 6. We see how this plays out in the story of Jonah. You might remember that God called him to go to the hated and wicked city of Nineveh. Of course, Jonah rebelled and he went to Tarshish instead before God sent a great fish to lead Jonah to repentance and back on mission. The book of Jonah ends with these words from the Lord. May I not care about the great city of Nineveh, which has more than 120,000 people who cannot distinguish between their right and their left, as well as many animals? Jonah chapter 4 verse 11. The last statement was not only an indictment of Jonah, it was a wake-up call for the nation of Israel. God chose them for the sake of mission, for the sake of blessing the entire world. His choice of Israel did not mean the rejection of other nations, but their inclusion through his chosen people. The temple of Israel represented what God wanted to do across the whole earth. He wanted to spread his name and his fame, not only to Israel, but among all the nations, so that Habakkuk's words might be fulfilled. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 14. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord's glory as the waters cover the sea. The temple was to be a beacon for all the nations, not only for Israel. Solomon desired for all the nations to hear of the glory of God, and he hoped that all the nations would gather and worship the God of Israel. The message of the greatness, mercy, and power of God has always been for all the nations. God wanted all those people who live apart from him to call on the name of the Lord, and that is true today. The urgency to live on mission is even greater for us as Christians. We are now the temple of God on the earth. God indwells us and fills us as his missional people. God called us and chose us for the purpose of representing him on the earth and spreading his fame to all the nations. And as we think of this great task before us, we must understand that it starts with ordinary Christians having ordinary conversations with ordinary people. It starts with you and with me, choosing each day to live our life on mission and being available for whatever God wants to do through us. It is virtually impossible to talk about following Jesus without also talking about how to help others to follow him also. Following Jesus by necessity means helping others follow him and obey him. As Christians, we are a saved people, but we are also a sent people. We are sent into the world to bear God's name and make him known to all the people of the earth. And one day, when we gather all we gather around the throne of Jesus Christ, we will sing, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slaughtered and you purchased people for God by your blood from every tribe, 
and language and people and nation. Revelation chapter 5 verse 9. Because the presence of God indwells us, we are to obey Him and make Him known so that the original purpose of the temple can be fulfilled, that the people of the earth will know that our God is King, and they will want to know Him personally, too. Oh, I hope you've enjoyed looking at the temple then and the temple now, us and have perhaps learned some new things or been reminded of some things. I know I have, and I'm so glad that you've joined with me. There will be a contact slide shortly, and I'd love to hear from you with any questions, comments, insights, or anything that you'd like to share. I'd love to hear from you. And I hope you will join me next time when we will be looking at Solomon's foolishness dividing the kingdom. Oh my, don't miss it. Until then, God bless you and keep you.